depth at running back, my disdain for LSU head coach Brian Kelly, and revisiting the starter spotlights. Those are some questions we're going to get into for this edition of Twitter Tuesday, your mailbag edition of Locked on Balls. You are Locked on Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into it. This is Locked On Balls. It is your go-to Tennessee Volunteers podcast each and every day, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It is your team every single day. Locked On Balls, your first listen, your first watch on YouTube and, of course, wherever you find your podcast, As always, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Got a major push. We are just about a buck fifty away uh, from, uh, maybe a little closer than that, from 3,000. The goal was 3,000 by kickoff, so we have just a little over a week to go ahead and make some ground on YouTube. So if you're listening, watching, viewing on YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. But got a fun show coming up. Can't thank you guys enough for hanging out with me today. We're going to do a mailbag edition here in segment number one and then of course we're going to get back into our scouting reports today week eight or week uh yeah week eight and nine on the schedule game seven and eight and that is ut martin and kentucky so that is the lay of the land let's go ahead and get into it this is locked on vols twitter tuesday right here on the show so We'll start with Benjamin. Benjamin commented on the show yesterday on YouTube, and you can always do that. So thanks, Benjamin, for doing that. Do you think Cam Selden will play running back or both running back and wide receiver? So an article where they are projecting him to play running back. I, I really do think it's going to be kind of a feel once he gets here. I think he'll go to one spot first, probably wide receiver, master that, learn that spot, and then kind of grow his role. The comparisons for Cam Selden were always Debo Samuel, and I understand Debo Samuel is an all-pro in the National Football League, so it's doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be that good, but the way that the 49ers use Debo Samuel is kind of like what Tennessee envisions in using uh, Cam Selton. But you got to start somewhere. I would envision he would start first a wide receiver, then play a little running back. Obviously, there's a bit of a need at running back right now with the current balls and with this class. You have Will Stallings, who's a part of the class, who's coming in to play running back. They could very easily maybe start Cam Selton at running back and then let his role grow into a wide receiver. We'll kind of have to see exactly how this class kind of shapes out. The transfer portal is also an option to bring in either a wide receiver, but likely a running back to kind of supplement this class. So uh, it's good to have options. He will be used, um, and I, I do believe before it's all said and done, he'll be used in both of those roles. But Ben, appreciate the question there. And uh, again, you can always find this podcast on YouTube, and you can submit your questions uh, there. Let's go to Willie and Josh. And both Willie and Josh have some questions about the running back room. We'll just read Willie's question here. Uh, do you see anyone that maybe didn't have a big role at a certain position moving to running back so they could help with the depth? This is the uh, least amount of depth I've ever seen from Tennessee having at running back, plus our top two backs are very injury prone. This has got me a little nervous. Again, this is from Willie, and then Josh chimed in as well about his concerns at the running back position. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of concern. Again, I can't stress enough. I do like what Tennessee has at these positions. I like Jabari Small, and I like Jalen Wright. I like what they've done in the offseason to prepare themselves for the grueling slate of an SEC schedule. They're both well over 200 pounds right now. They look physically bigger and better. Um, but we know, as I've mentioned plenty of times, as you guys know watching the football games, Jabari Small didn't finish a lot of football games last year. He missed a couple of football games. Jalen Wright missed a couple football games, and then you have two freshmen. So there is a concern there, no doubt. Um, I do believe that in a in an emergency situation, you'll see a you'll see a tight end back there, probably Princeton Fant. Princeton Fant has played just about every position uh, throughout his Tennessee career. You know, this is his sixth year, and so he was seen taking a couple of handoffs out of the shotgun position uh, back in spring practice. Um, at the very least, I could see him lining up in the backfield on third downs to help you know protect the quarterback. And, th and that's unfortunate because that means if he's back in the backfield, then he's not running routes. Um, you can still have a tight end there, tight end in there. You can still have Jacob Warm out, Jacob Warm out there running or you know, Miles Campbell or Charlie Brown or whoever. But I do believe the emergency tight end or the emergency running back would be Princeton fan out of the backfield. That's just kind of how I see it. But Again, it's a grueling schedule. It's a grueling season. Tennessee's going to play all four of those running backs. Those two true freshman running backs are going to have a major role, and they're just going to have to get ready. Uh, we'll go to Kay Wayne. 
before fall camp, you did a starter spotlight series where you previewed and had some predictions for somebody's calling me right now for each position. Now that we're at the end of fall camp, which positions have changed your status in terms of predictions? Also, who was the most overrated and underrated teams on Tennessee's schedule? Good question. Um, the starter spotlight series, I pretty much went through and I highlighted who I believe would be the starter at each position. Um, off the top of my head, you know, defensive tackle, of course, Amore Thomas is going to start at one of those. I think I said Karat Garland was probably going to be the other one. But again, I think even at the time I said that's a rotational position. Of course, Garland's going to see some action. You're going to see Deshaun Terry play some. You're going to see Bryson Eason play. Latrell Bumpus will play a little bit. Um, you know, there, there's there's Elijah Simmons is going to play a little bit. So there, there's a lot of guys that will uh, play at that defensive tackle st- spot. Um, the star position. I think I had Wesley Walker there as the starter, the transfer from Georgia Tech, and he very well could still be the starter. But I think right now, Tamari McDonald's a guy that's on pace to start, and what a story that is. A guy that's been a non-factor defensively here at Tennessee his first two years, but it just kind of, you know, lunch pail, salt mine type mentality. It's just gone to work every single day. Lunch pail, salt mine. That's, that's uh, I believe that's how you say it, that phrase. Um, and I think he's going to play a whole lot at the star position. So I would change the star prediction in terms of the starter to Tamari and Donald right now. Cornerback, I still don't know. I mean, I think Christian Charles is going to start. Probably Warren Burrell. Um, but then again, I think if Kamal Haddon's available, which he's working himself back in there, I think Kamal Haddon will start. So maybe it's a Kamal Haddon, Warren Burrell situation. Um, but I think Christian Charles will start. So we'll have to see exactly what the cornerback position still kind of fizzles out to look like. But, um, you know, if, if no Bru McCoy, a wide receiver, if he's still not eligible, then Probably Walker Merrill will be the first one out there because he's been the most consistent in practice, but you'll still see Ramel Keaton. You'll still see a little Jimmy Holiday and some of these younger guys like Jazz and Emrod, maybe Caleb Webb. So, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, but that's kind of how I would visit that or view that. Uh, we'll go on now to the most overrated team on the schedule. I'll say Pitt. I still think Pitt's going to be a challenge. I still think Pitt's going to be a really, really tough opponent. Um, absolutely. Uh, I do not think Pitt is going to be the 17th ranked team in the country when it's all said and done. I think you just lost too much. I think you're going to take a ginormous step back at quarterback, and I think that you are going to miss not having Jordan Addison. I understand you got a lot on the offensive line. Got you got to love your front seven. I get all that. We previewed Pitt last week, and I talked about uh, the respect I have for that program and what they, you know, what they can present this year. But I would still say Pitt. Underrated, and this kind of goes in with another question coming up later, and I'll expand on this. Underrated, I'll say South Carolina. Um, I'm not buying into the South Carolina hype just yet, but I know they're getting it. Um, but they have retooled this offseason. He's recruiting well, that being Shane Beamer. So I would say South Carolina. We're all just assuming Tennessee is going to go beat South Carolina by a couple scores. I think Tennessee is going to beat South Carolina, but – that would probably be my answer right now. So good question there, Kay Wayne. Good questions. Appreciate you chiming in via the uh, the DMs. And we'll go lastly to, via the DMs, we'll go uh, to the Locked on Vols Twitter account where we have a DM. We're going to check in with Alex. Do you think there's any chance they will make Taven Jackson the backup quarterback over Joe Milton? Oh, uh, right now, no. And that's no... That's no indictment on um, on Taven Jackson whatsoever, okay? That just means Joe Milton's a seasoned veteran. Joe Milton's been around the block a few times. Joe Milton has experience. And Joe Milton had a really good spring and is having a great camp. I think Taven Jackson's continuing to learn, 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 get reps, being a sponge, soaking up everything he sees from both Joe and, of course, Hendon Hooker. Uh, maybe as the season goes on, that'll change. But without a doubt, I could say with 100% certainty, right now Joe Milton is the uh, the starting uh or excuse me, the backup quarterback, without a doubt. All right, we'll go back to the Kaner account at underscore Kaner on Twitter, and we will check uh, the bookmarks. Whenever you guys tweet me, I bookmark these, and we'll see what's going on with Blah. During the season on Twitter, or excuse me, on Thursday or Friday, can you show uh, on the show, can you announce what TV station and time the game will be on? I had big issues with this last year, trying to rely on Google. Love seeing you on the talking balls, my guy. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely do that. Uh, I have a, I do a, a, a glance, kind of a first glance type situation earlier in the week, and then I have a, a strong preview on Friday. And of course, I'll put all that information in there. If you've noticed during these, um, during these scouting reports, I, I put 
if they had that destination and that time for the early games. I've already put that in there, but absolutely, I'll do that. That'll be part of my uh, preview for sure. We'll go to K. Smith. Is there a game that we're all assuming is a win for the Vols that might be a toss-up? Yeah, that's where I'll expand on South Carolina a little bit. They got, you know, South Carolina. Uh, that's what I would say. I still think that's going to be a win for Tennessee, but they're good at the quarterback position at Spencer Rattler. They added, uh, you know, running back from Wake Forest. That's really, really good. They've gotten better on defense. Um, I think they have more weapons than they did last year. And let's, let's be real. They won seven games last season um, in the regular season when, or I think, yeah, because they finished with eight wins overall, I believe. No, they finished with seven wins overall with that bowl win. Regardless, they had a guy playing quarterback that was 26 years old and couldn't throw it 20 yards by the end of the season, right? Um, and it was an unfortunate situation, and they still were able to get better and better and better as the season gone on. Then Lou Doty finally came back in there and gave him a little something, something as well. But um, South Carolina would be that team that I would uh, predict to be you know, the one where everybody just assumes Tennessee's going to win. Everybody's already pegging Tennessee as a winner there, but – might want to watch out. Plus, that game's in Columbia. So um, it's at the end of the season. What does Tennessee look like then? What does uh, South Carolina look like then? Um, obviously, that's a lot to uh, kind of pay attention to. So uh, that's where I will go there. I think we got one more that I need to uh, check in on. Oh, wait, we got two more real quick. Uh, a lot of you guys, not just one person, a lot of you guys are wondering why <laughs> I was going off on Brian Kelly uh, yesterday. Listen, first and foremost, this is one man's opinion. You guys know I can be very opinionated. This is just my opinion to each his own. Uh, Brian Kelly, I think he's a scumbag first and foremost because of the situation that happened early in his tenure at Notre Dame. If you guys remember, if not, go back, look it up online. A tragic accident. There was a student worker, 20 years old. He was up on the scissor lift. They use that scissor lift to, um, to film practices, and they still do, but a lot of times they're outlawing that now because of situations like this. It's very dangerous. But there was a kid on the scissor lift filming the practice for Notre Dame, and they had wind, wind gusts up to about 50 miles per hour that day, and he fell and he lost his life. Um, the scissor lift fell over, and tragically, he lost his life. Now, I'm not saying that's a direct, you know, the, the Brian Kelly is directly at fault for that. I'm not saying that. But, you know, he, he the thing with Brian Kelly is he just never takes ownership. You know, when interviewed and asked about it in the, in the days and weeks and months that followed, said, hey, it was a beautiful day. I'm shocked. I don't know what happened. It was a beautiful day. There are people on record, including the young man who was tweeting up until, you know, he fell that was saying, oh, I'm so scared. This wind gust, what am I doing up here? Yada, yada, yada. Um, the AD was involved in this as well. They were trying to almost cover it up like it was a beautiful day and it was just a free accident. No, the wind was blowing. There was no reason for him to be up there. So, Again, it wasn't his direct fault. I'm not trying to say that, but just the, my biggest thing about Brian Kelly is he's always pointing the finger. He's never pulling the thumb. Uh, consistently throughout his career, he's always blaming, blaming his players in postseason, or excuse me, in postgame press conferences. Always blaming his players in postgame press conferences. At one point, Dom, he was blaming Charlie Watts and his recruiting and why he couldn't win early in his tenure at Notre Dame. I mean, dude, kind of grow up a little bit. There was a story when he took over the LSU job, and this is the last example I'll do. Uh, where Matt LaFleur, of course, head football coach of the Green Bay Packers, and Robert uh, Sala, the head football coach of the New York Jets, they were graduate assistants at Central Michigan when Brian Kelly was the head coach there. And he had this big type fundraiser ball at his house, big dinner, all that type of stuff. And he invited them. And so they showed up in suit and tie and thought that they were going to the event only to be handed shovels to shovel snow all night long. That's the type of guy that Brian Kelly is. So just my opinion, but nonetheless... It is what it is. A lot of you guys asked, so I thought I would answer. And then finally, we'll go back to uh, Facebook real quick, and we will check in with, um, let's see here, it is Sam. Sam wants to know about the depth at running back a little bit, but these freshman running backs, Dylan Sampson and Justin Williams-Thomas, and how it could be a good thing that they're going to be getting a whole lot of reps for, you know, as true freshmen, how that can be a good thing for, um, their careers to follow. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, they're going to be studs, in my opinion. Both those guys, Justin Williams, Thomas, I think is going to be an absolute stud. Um, I, I, I still do have concerns though. Until they kind of figure things out, they're going to look like freshmen. They'll have freshman moments this season, and that's okay. But you shouldn't have to rely so much on freshmen in the backfield, in my opinion. Tennessee's going to have to do that this year. They're just going to have to roll with the punches, and that is a very much a reactionary position where you just take the ball and run, see, hole, run, hit, hole, that type of stuff, kind of like linebacker a little bit. There's obviously more to it. I understand that. But, yeah, they're going to get battle-tested here early as freshmen, and they'll, they'll end up being 
really experienced football players by midseason. I'll say that. So is it good for them down the line? Absolutely. Um, is it still a concern that Tennessee is going to have to rely so so heavily on a pair of freshman running backs? In my opinion, yes. But they are having good camps, and I think that they're going to be just fine. That'll do it here for the Mailbag Edition, Twitter Tuesday. Thanks so much for getting me in your questions, your comments, and your concerns. And uh, when we come back, we'll start our scouting report. Little UT Martin kicking things off before we get to Kentucky. But first, I want to remind you guys about BetOnline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in with all your sports betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every single league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline.net continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have you covered. Head on over to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn about all the latest trends and all the action at BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net. It is where the game starts. I want to thank you guys so much for making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. The ultimate college football preview is here. What it is is a seven-episode preview with college experts like your boy. I'll be on it either today or tomorrow. Um, and local team experts, the Odyssey Football College Insiders. It's everything you need to be ready for the college football season all in one spot. Search for the ultimate college football preview on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you find your podcast. That's the ultimate college football preview. It is here. Let's get back into our scouting reports as we welcome you back in here to Locked on Vols. It is your team every single day, the University of Tennessee Volunteers podcast, your go-to podcast. Scouting reports, UT Martin. UT Martin is week eight, game number seven that's on the schedule this year. It is Saturday, October 22nd. And of course, uh, no uh, no TV destination or time right now. Of course, they always do those a couple of weeks before. Uh, so you've got three SEC games that lead up to UT Martin. You play UT Martin, and then it's five straight SEC games to end the season. So it's a little bit of a breather during this tough stretch for the University of Tennessee. Head coach is Jason Simpson. All right, if you guys remember Ty Simpson, that five-star quarterback prospect Josh Heupel was in on as, uh, as soon as he, and of course Jeremy Pruitt was during early on in Josh Heupel's tenure during the transition. He ended up choosing Alabama, of course, but his father is Jason Simpson. Has a 99-79 and record at UT Martin, a 9-2 and record this past fall, and they were the Ohio Valley Conference champions for the first time ever, that being UT Martin. In 2021, great scoring offense, 30 points per game. That was second in the OVC. Uh, they rushed for 207 yards per contest. That led the OVC, and they ran for over five yards a carry at 5.3 yards per attempt. They've got to replace the OVA, the OVA, <laughs> the OVA, Ohio Valley Conference. I'm trying to get ahead of myself. The Ohio Valley Conference Offensive Player of the Year and quarterback. Uh, Kevin Howard, he is gone, of course, graduated and left the program. But they do have some guys who have played an awful lot that will be contending to be the starting quarterback for uh, UT Martin this season. You have Dresser Wynn, okay? He is a super senior. He started 12 games as a freshman and sophomore and actually played in two playoff games, started two playoff games when Kevin Howard was injured last season. So he's got experience. He also brought in a transfer from Georgia State and Cornelius Brown, who threw for 2,278 yards and 20 touchdowns just two seasons ago in 2020. So it's going to be Brown and Wynn battling it out right now to see who the starting quarterback is going to be for the UT Martin Skyhawks. At running back, you bring back Zach Wallace, 807 yards, 15 touchdowns in 2021. That is That was a first-team Ohio Valley Conference running back in Zach Wallace. Wide receiver Colton Dowell. A super senior, 110 receptions, 1,760 yards, which is really, really good. 13 touchdowns in his career. So he's had a solid career. Not a really, not a big time breakout career guy or one year guy, but obviously 15 touchdowns and over 1,700 yards. It's a pretty solid career there for a wide receiver. So you bring back Zach Wallace in the backfield, a wide receiver, and Colton Dowell. And all five starters on the offensive line are not returning, but they all earned. Uh, Ohio Valley Conference all-conference honors last season. So that was really, really impressive. And a reason why that offense was so good, uh, you returned a couple of those guys led by center Matthew Hatchie, who is a Lindy Sports preseason All-American. Defensively, it's pretty stout as well. Gave up just 25 points per game. That was second in the OVC. Seven players earned all OVC honors, but most of those guys are graduated from the team last year. 
Linebacker John H. Ford, a super senior, had 83 tackles. That was second on the team last season. He had four interceptions. Safety Devin Sims, a super senior as well, 93 tackles. That was first on the team last season and is a Lindy's preseason defensive player of the year for the Ohio Valley Conference. So that will bring back an awful lot of experience on, on uh, defense, but they're good at linebacker with John H. Ford and great at safety with Devin Sims. Also, up front, they're kind of new. They don't have a, an awful lot of experience, but they do return Iaba Anoma, I believe is how you say his name. If you guys remember, he was a signee for Alabama in 2018. He was dismissed from the Alabama football team, later landed at UT Martin, and in 2021, this guy had six sacks and 36 tackles up front for the Skyhawks at UT Martin. So that's a look at UT Martin. Again, not a whole lot. I mean, we're not going to spend an awful lot of time on UT Martin. I do think they're a very well-coached football team. I do think they found success, obviously, offensively last season, but they lost a lot as well. Bring back a talented running back, bring back a good receiver who's had a solid career, bring back a really good center. And then defensively, they bring back a linebacker and a strong safety. But outside of that, really searching for some guys to step up and kind of uh, you know step into the place of what was a very successful team last year. 30 points a game offensively, gave up just 25, which is pretty stout on the other end. And uh, Ohio Valley Conference champions for the first time ever for that program, the UT Martin Skyhawks. So that's a look at what Tennessee's getting in UT Martin. That is, <clears throat> excuse me, week number eight, game number seven. And now let's flip the page and talk about Kentucky. That is coming up next as our scouting reports roll on right here on Locked on Balls. We got a final segment left here on this Tuesday edition of Locked on Balls. Of course, it is your team every single day. Locked on Balls, your first listen, your first watch on YouTube every single day. Can't thank you guys enough for hanging out with me and uh, going over some scouting reports. You know, we've talked most important games. We've talked toughest games. The season is next week. Kickoff is on Thursday of next week. So we're getting our scouting reports on the uh, the opponent previews, if you will. And now we've made our way all the way to the mid-season slate. And it is a monstrous game in the Kentucky Wildcats. Week 9 of the season, game number 8 of the season, Saturday, October 29th. Head coach Mark Stoops is in his 10th year. And Kentucky is 59-53 and 53 under his tutelage. That is the second longest tenured SEC coach. Mark Stoops is the second longest SEC tenured coach. That's incredible. That just goes to show you that in college football, if you're not winning, you're out in a hurry, right? Obviously, Nick Saban has a longer tenure, but outside of Nick Saban, Mark Stoops has been at his current spot longer than any other coach in the Southeastern Conference. That is um, that's pretty remarkable when you think about it, but he's done a nice job. 10-3 and three a season ago. That was the second 10-win season in the past four years for Kentucky. 45-42, Kentucky did lose to Tennessee last year at Kroger Field um, in a game where there was just no defense until, hey, the final the final drive where Tennessee did bow up and, and win that football game. So uh, the Volunteers looking for its second win in a row over Kentucky and its fourth in the last five seasons. Offensively, in 2021, 23 turnovers. See this phone? I'm throwing it on the ground. It's infuriating how much it's vibrated here in this episode. I apologize. Uh, everybody on YouTube got a show. If you're listening to it, just imagine me picking up my phone and throwing it across the room. Just annoying. Uh, back to Kentucky offensively in 2021, 23 turnovers. That was tied for most in the SEC, so not fantastic numbers. It was minus 11 in turnover margin on the season. So that's you never want to be negatives in turnover margin. Always want to be pluses, but you turn the football over 23 times, and there's a reason why for it. Um, if you're high on Kentucky, you're high on quarterback Will Levis. Um, I think he's a bit overrated, but, and I made this comment about Anthony Richardson, and oh boy, so many people got upset, but here it is again. Will Levis will play in the National Football League, okay? If you don't believe me, look up a mock draft, okay? Will Levis will play in the National Football League. I'm not saying he'll be a star. I'm not saying he'll be a face of a franchise. I'm not saying he'll be a first-round pick, but Will Levis will play in the National Football League, <laughs> but he threw, he turned it over a ton last year. Just a lot of talent there. He's the type of quarterback the NFL wants nowadays. Big, athletic, dual threat, that type of stuff can extend plays with his legs. Not necessarily a runner, but can extend plays. Uh, he threw for over 2,800 yards a season ago, 24 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. That, that INT rate's a little too high, but uh, still 24 touchdowns. 376 yards rushing, nine rushing touchdowns. He did lead the team 
with nine rushing touchdowns. So obviously they're going to use his uh, running ability uh, to help them as well. <clears throat> Kentucky does have a new offensive coordinator by the name of Rich Scan Garello. Uh, recently, he was the quarterback's coach for the San Francisco 49ers. So Kentucky's doing it again. They're going to the NFL to um, have a guy come in and, and, and be their play caller. Of course, Cohen was there last year, had NFL experience, and now he has left after one year back to the NFL. Uh, t- Kentucky did lose its top two wide receivers from a year ago, of course, in Wondell Robinson, who's now a member of the New York Giants, and Josh Ali, who was a big time uh, target for Will Levis, big in stature, about six foot four, six foot five. They bring back wide receiver Demarcus Harris, who only had 12 receptions for 150 yards. So that's their leading receiver coming back this season. Uh, Isaiah Cummings, they're tied in 14 receptions, 195 yards, and th- three touchdowns. Um, he is likely to. Play a bigger role this season, obviously. Uh, Transfer wide receiver from Virginia Tech, Tavion Robinson's expected to have a big role for Kentucky. 44 receptions, 559 yards, and five touchdowns in 2021. Kentucky needs wide receiver, so he's predicted to step in and fill a void there. Uh, They need freshman wide receivers, Barry and Brown, an in-state prospect from the University of Tennessee for the Mid-States, and Dane Key to help out a lot. Again, they don't have a whole lot of talent, or at least proven talent, at wide receiver right now, so they want those freshman wideouts to really step in this camp and and help. And I've heard that Be- uh, Byron Brown's had a really fall, uh, re- really good fall camp, so we'll see how much of a factor that he plays. Um, obviously, Rodriguez, Chris Rodriguez, the running back. You know, I've spoken about him on the show countless times. One thousand three hundred seventy nine yards rushing in uh, twenty twenty one. One of the best running backs in the SEC, a first team All SEC running back a season ago. And they bring back Smoke in the backfield as well. Copy Smoke. 416 yards and four touchdowns in 2021. Uh, Chris Rodriguez, though, you know, potentially is going to be out for the first couple of games of the season. There was a report over the weekend that, of course, he got in trouble with a DUI over the offseason or over the summer, or I guess it was last spring, really. But I, I think because of that, coupled with a couple of other disciplinary issues, team breaking team rules, there was a report out there that he could miss the first two or three games of the season. So, that could impact Kentucky's game against Florida early in the season, a couple of those big-time early matchups, but that would not be good. Chris Rodriguez, who's just about, I think, fourteen or 1,500 yards shy of the Kentucky rushing record, so we'll have to see how that situation plays out, but he'll be back for the Tennessee game. Of course he will. <laughs> the offensive line loses three starters up front, but does bring back guard Kenneth Horsey, who's a three-year starter, and they've added Auburn transfer guard Sean Manning, so... Losing a little bit, bringing some in to help supplement that. You know Kentucky's always pretty sharp with a lot of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively. Speaking of defense, uh, 340 yards per game. That was fourth in the SEC a season ago, giving up 21 points, or excuse me, 340 yards given up per game. That was fourth in the SEC. Surrendered only 21.7 points per game. That was only fourth in the SEC. Man, that's tough sledding. You allow 21 points a game, and that's still fourth in the SEC. That's not top three, number one, number two. Woo, that's tough sledding. Uh, really need help at cornerback and defensive line because you lost a lot. They are really good at linebacker, uh, is Kentucky. Jack West Jones, 85 tackles a season ago. DeAndre Square, we know that name, 80 tackles, nine and a half TFLs on the outside position. Linebacker J.J. Weaver also had six sacks uh, a season ago. That led Kentucky. They're pretty stout at linebacker, okay? Um, they're really good at safety. Tyrell Agian, six-year guy, 46 tackles, 23 career starts. Um, it's safety for Kentucky, but Carrington Valentine's really the only cornerback that has seen extensive time for Kentucky, and uh, they're going to look to really uh, try to create some competition back there uh, because Kentucky and Mark Stoops is always a pretty good defensive team. So this is your typical Kentucky football team, albeit this is the best quarterback, and I know Will Rogers hasn't been all world, and I understand he's overhyped, and I believe he's overhyped a little bit, but this is the best quarterback Kentucky has had. In a long time. This is the best quarterback Mark Stoops has ever had, no doubt about it. So they're, they're athletic in the quarterback position, but they're one to dominate a lot of scrimmage, run the football, control the pace of the play. It's interesting, though. Kentucky always wants to hold the football and shrink the game, meaning run the football, not have as many possessions throughout the football game. But Kentucky was not fantastic in time of possession last season. In fact, they were near the back of the SEC. Tennessee was obviously worse with that pace. Tennessee's going to lose the possession battle. Um, every single game. In fact, in this game last year, I'm pretty sure Tennessee only had the football for a little over 10 minutes. Isn't that wild? <laughs> like, isn't that wild? I think it was like 13 minutes. Isn't that crazy? Because Tennessee had a couple of quick scoring drives 
Well, Bayless Jones Jr. and and, and uh, Javon De Payton both took screen passes to the house in the first two possessions on you know play one or play two of the drive. That was just insane. But uh, Kentucky really didn't win the time of possession battle much last season, which is very interesting. So um, solid football team, above average quarterback, in my opinion, athletically and, and for what he can do. Really good running back. Lost a lot on the offensive line. We'll need to uh, develop chemistry and get better there. Lost a lot of wide receiver. That's an issue there. Defensively, no defensive lineman. Octavia, Octavius Octine, a former Tennessee targets, uh, a big guy that's made a bunch of starts up there. Um, great at linebacker is Kentucky. Um, and a little inexperience in the secondary for sure. So some question marks for Kentucky, but obviously a lot of talent. Big time football game. That'll be at Neyland Stadium, week nine of the season, game number eight on October 29th, and thus will end a grueling month of October for the Volunteers. That starts with LSU, Alabama, UT Martin, and Kentucky. That is all in the month of October. All right, that's going to do it for our scouting reports here on a Tuesday, and really that's going to do it for our show here on a Tuesday. Guys, thank you so much for making Lockdown Vols your first listen your first watch on YouTube, you know the drill. If you haven't already, please subscribe on the YouTube channel. Click subscribe and follow us on YouTube. That is Locked On Falls, the YouTube channel. But most importantly, thank you so much for listening wherever you find your podcast. Now that uh, we're done here, uh, if you still want to listen to some podcasts, go check out Chris Gordy, Locked On SEC. Make that your second listen, Locked On SEC with Chris Gordy. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. If you were new to the show, you enjoyed it, please come back. If not, uh, well... It was good talking to you, but we're going to do it again tomorrow no matter what. Pull up a chair, and we'll try again tomorrow each and every day. Same time, same place. Guys, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody.